Kia ora everybody and welcome to Speak Up Kōrerotia. My name is Sally Carlton. See, sorry, mixed that up a wee bit. Yeah. Um, Sally Carlton, uh, the host of the radio show Speak Up Kōrerotia. Today we're going to be talking about deaf education in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and how things have changed over the years and what they look like today. We're going to have two interviewees. Our first interview is with Kay Drew, who is hearing and a child of deaf parents and who taught for many years at the Van Ash Deaf Education Centre in Christchurch. Um, Kay's going to talk with us about the institutional history of the Van Ash Deaf Education Centre or VDEC um, and also how teaching and communication practices have changed over time. Uh, before talking to us a wee bit about um, the current focus on New Zealand Sign Language. Uh, and then our second interview will be with Sarah Pivak alexander um, of Te Heringa Waka Victoria University Wellington, who will talk to us a bit about um, her work at the university and the importance of New Zealand Sign Language. Uh, and she is deaf and she uses New Zealand Sign Language as her first language. So we also have Rachel McKee, also from Te Heringa Waka, who is acting as interpreter for this show. In the first interview with me and Kay, she's just signing for the video recording. Um, and in the second interview with Sarah, you will hear Rachel's voice as she interprets for Sarah. So some final detail just before we jump in with our interviews. According to the census in 2018, approximately 22,000 New Zealanders, including about 4,600 deaf New Zealanders, use New Zealand Sign Language every day. New Zealand Sign Language became an official language of Aotearoa in 2006, and every May we have New Zealand Sign Language Week, which acknowledges and celebrates the role of this language in our country and in our culture. So this Speak Up Korea show, show today is just one small contribution to raising the visibility and awareness of New Zealand Sign Language in the country. So Kay, it's really lovely to have you on the show today. We've sent many emails, so it's really nice to see you finally in person. Thank you very much for asking me. Could you please tell us a little bit about your connection to uh, deaf education, just to set the scene? Well, my I think my connection began when I was born. I was born to two deaf people whom I just adored. They now, of course, passed on. And they were early pupils of the school, which was then called Sumner School for Deaf Children. Um, I also, um, I'm a very proud coder, which is a child of deaf adults. That's what we call ourselves. And I'm also um, always welcomed into the deaf community, which to me is a very happy occasion. Uh, I also taught for over 30 years at the school. Okay, is it unusual for a hearing child to be born of two deaf parents? Yes, it is and it isn't. Deafness is a hereditary factor in some cases, and therefore if they have deaf parents and it's of her the deafness is hereditary, then often the children are born deaf. In my family, it was but we deafness was not known until my third grandson was born and he was born profoundly deaf. That came as a huge surprise to us because we had no knowledge that there was a deaf hereditary gene tucked away somewhere. So he became, strangely enough, not a signer. He had a cochlear implant. So deafness and communication can be very varied. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about, I guess, the different pathways or the different ways that people um, have learnt to live their lives as deaf people. Yes. Maybe I could go, can I speak? Yeah, maybe... Maybe we could go right back to the beginning. That's when it, everything starts at the beginning. 
Um, way back in 1877, a very important educational act was passed here in New Zealand. There were two people who promoted it. It was a Colonel Brett and William Rolleston. They were both members of the Canterbury Provincial Council. And they said children in New Zealand at the time had to have an education. So they put it to the central government. And the government at the time was very forward thinking. So they made a, a law in which in 1877, in which it said all children would be educated. It would be free. It would be secular, meaning it was not run by religious groups, and it would be compulsory for all children from five to 14 years of age. So when that, that began, then these two gentlemen I just mentioned before found there were deaf people, deaf, deaf people um, in the community, and there was a need to educate them because of the act. It was compulsory. So a school had to be found or a, some place where they could be educated. So what happened then? They looked overseas and they found there were two very important modes of communication in the world at the time. One was the German method and one was the French method. The German method was where it, you lip read and you were taught articulation, which is speaking. The other method, method was the French method, where you signed, just signed completely. They did a lot of research, and they decided on the German method. So therefore, they had to find somebody who would teach the children of the deaf children of New Zealand with the German method. So they found a very interesting man called Gerrit Van Ash. He was from Holland. And he came from a farming family, but he was very interested in teaching deaf children. He went to Manchester in England, which for many years became the, the teaching, the, the guru place for training teachers of the deaf. However, at that time he went there, he didn't speak a word of English. So he had to learn English and to learn how to teach deaf children through the German method. So that all got sorted and he was brought out to New Zealand. He came with his family and they settled in Sumner in a house called Beach Glen in Heberdean Avenue. Then um, after they, they settled there and then some children started to come as boarders. In those early days, the little ones went to the school. Some of them are quite young uh, and they became boarders and they went home twice a year. So then the, the role expanded a bit so boys' house was built in the Sumner area. And so the boys were in the, in the boys' house and the girls were in Beach Glen, kept them apart in those days. And um, I can go now to my mother and father. My father was enrolled in 1902. He was the second day pupil of the school. And my mother was enrolled in 1907. And she came from Dargaville very way up on the top end of the North Island. And family history tells us that her mother, my grandmother, brought her all the way down from Dargaville to Sumner. Took one look and said she couldn't leave. I think my mum would have been about five or six. Couldn't leave her in this boarding situation. It was too hard. So she went all the way back to Dargaville. And there she was spoken to very sternly by my grandfather, who said, Nora, that was my mother's name, has to be educated. It's the law. <laughs> so they did the journey back again. And my mother was there for, I'm not quite sure when, she, probably be 14 when she left. I, I can't remember. She became the head girl. And she was very popular because her mother would send parcels of food and lollies and things. So it was lovely. And my dad was more like, I think he might've stayed a few nights in boy's house because he told me the story about climbing the hills around Sumner and trapping rabbits and things. Anyway, that's enough of their story. My father was taught by Van Ash and my father had no residual hearing whatsoever. And he told me how he had a big hearing trumpet put in his ear. He couldn't hear a word. And Van Ash would speak into that. And then he would talk to dad and try and get dad to say the vowels and the consonants of the words we spoke. So that was the beginning of the oral method, which was talking and lip reading. 
Talk, lip reading, many people think that lip reading is God's given gift to deaf people. It's not. Lip reading is a very difficult skill to learn because people don't use their mouths correctly. People have moustaches and beards, and lately they have masks, and there's no way you can, you can read someone's lips. Some deaf people are very proficient at it and very good. The... Um, I can't think where I got to from there. From the articulation point of view, they would be. Um, I remember trying to teach Dad, telling me how that Van Ash used to help get him to talk or to use plosives, which are the p sounds. And he'd have a piece of paper, a little tissue, in front of his mouth. And if he could do that p sound, the paper would move. So there were no hearing aids in those days. Some children developed very good speaking skills and some didn't. My father's voice, because he never heard a thing, was quite difficult for most people to understand, whereas my mother had some residual hearing. So it was easier for her to communicate and to be understood. My father was a great reader and he, was, he taught me many good things about reading, about learning about the world and about history. My mother was a lady, and she taught me, hopefully, all the good things about being a lady and a good house, housewife. <laughs> okay, is that enough on that area? That was a super fantastic introduction. Thank, thank you. Um, I have one question. Why yes. was it in Christchurch? And I recognize the name Rolleston from Rolleston Avenue. Uh, yes. Is that the connection there? Yes, William Rolleston became the superintendent of the Canterbury Provincial Council. And he wanted it because they found there were, I think, was it quite a number of deaf children here? He wanted to set the school up in Christchurch or in Canterbury. So they looked around and they thought Sumner was a good place. It was close to Christchurch and it was a warm valley. That was the reason that they got there. One of the reasons, yeah. You stressed that word warm. Is there a reason for that? I taught there for many years. I don't think I'd say it was that warm. No, I wouldn't either. <laughs> no, I don't know. Well, when I read that, I thought, I'm not too sure about that. But in those days, it may have been warm. We have terrible prevailing winds here in Christchurch. Maybe it, it was a sheltered area. Okay, when I was looking through the website, one thing that struck me was that the school role obviously peaked at certain times. Um, particularly as a result of rubella epidemics. And presumably that had an impact on children being born, I would think. Is that right? Yes, ru rubella, um, before it was today, rubella can be prevented. But rubella is really quite a dangerous um, uh, disease for pregnant women. And the first three months of pregnancy, mm -hmm. that's when the uh, fetus is developing the hearing organs and they can be damaged quite severely or not. There was a huge outbreak in the 40s, and that's where there was a lot of deaf children being born. Mm -hmm. But also the role was increasing rapidly, even through the 30s. It was increasing rapidly, mainly borders going. So the school, oh, I forgot to say, I think it was 1907, the main building. It was a big, big building that was built at the end of the school near Evans Pass Road. It was rather austere. It was designed in England and I think they got the sun you know they, they see the sun a different way up there than we do down here they have everything facing south where we want everything facing north so the building was sort of built around the wrong way it was I taught in that building as a very young teacher the the classrooms were upstairs and downstairs were the boarding establishment were the borders where they slept the dormitories and the kitchen so that building became very important for the borders to stay in, but they became got to the stage with the outbreak of rubella, there just wasn't the room. So at the time, the principal was was Mr. Pickering, Mr. H Mr. Herbert Pickering, Bert, he was, that's right. And he decided that they just couldn't carry on anymore. So the idea was was worked out or decided that a school would be built in Titarangi in Auckland, and it would be called the Kelston School for Deaf Children. So that was established in about 1940. 
Pickering was a great principal. He also um, set up uh, speech um, classes to train teachers in speech and language. And he also got classes for training deaf, deaf teachers or teachers of the deaf as well. So he's a very innovative man. Fantastic. Kay, could you tell us a wee bit about how teaching practices changed over time? When were you teaching at the Van Ash Centre? I was in the German method. I was not allowed to sign. And I always was able to give good lip patterns because that was how we communicated with the deaf. Um, I always remember this story. I had a group, one of my first, my first class, lovely children, and they started to sign between each other. So I joined in the conversation. They were horrified that a teacher could actually understand the signing. So what had happened, we think going back in time, there was a person called Dorcas Mitchell who was um, teaching four deaf children in Charteris Bay, which is in Littleton. Uh, Reverend Bradley was the father, and he brought Dorcas Mitchell out from a school for the deaf and dumb, I hate that word, um, from London. So she came. We think she may have introduced some of the rudiments of BSL, which is British Sign Language. So the sign language was there. As the children became, when they worked together, they signed to each other, although it was never allowed in the classroom. So because it's a living, growing language, the signs increased over time. So that was sort of the beginning of it. When I was in this classroom, it was delightful. Later on, things changed. In about the 70s, a thing called, well, a process was called total communication. Now, I was responsible for introducing it. It was very hard. I'll tell you why. We used Auslan, which is Australian Sign Language. And why did we use that and not New Zealand Sign Language? Auslan had, may, had a lot of resources. We, at the time, because New Zealand Sign Language had been stifled and, and not allowed to develop, but it was underground, we had very few resources. So I had to learn. Auslan and use it in a signed English mode, which means my my name is K Drew, which means that I am signing every word that I say. That is not a sign language. That is a signed English language. That was the, I think the deaf community was very upset here in New Zealand where that was introduced. And they used to ask me why. And I said, well, maybe this is the first step in getting New Zealand Sign Language recognized. And I think it was. Because as time went on, signed English was phased out. But the important thing was that because New Zealand Sign Language is a growing living language, they could use some of the signs from Auslan. Like the English language, because it's a good living language, is always using new words. So New Zealand Sign Language is the same. So they were using many of the Auslan words. They would use BSL words. So the language is growing and growing. Another thing that really promoted sign language was the World Games for the Deaf. And that was held in 1989. It was the 16th World Games of the Deaf. It was the first time it had been held down under. And there, we organized classes to train interpreters. It was a mammoth task. And Rachel, she was one of the one of the main people to help to train different people. We had different people who knew some sign language. We had deaf people who knew sign language in classes, teaching people to communicate with those that were coming to the games. It was about 32 nations came. It was great. So that promoted New Zealand Sign Language even more. Plus, we had um, the, the school employed deaf teachers to come, and that was huge. That was wonderful. And as there is now, there are deaf teachers and deaf tutors for New Zealand Sign Language. There are deaf teacher aides, I presume. So we've come a long way since the German method. And when was it that sign language was, I suppose, formally implemented in place of oral methods? That would be total communication, you mean? The signed uh, English? 
I suppose so. So, so it went from oral method to total communication to New Zealand sign language. New Zealand. And, and when was sign language? I guess the predominant. It was sort of like I think it was a flow through. It wasn't a mm -hmm. cut off point, mm -hmm. which was better because a lot of people spent a lot of time learning signed English. That was just a gentle mm -hmm. flow, which mm -hmm. made it a much easier transition. And so, by say the nineteen nineties, mid nineteen nineties. New Zealand Sign Language was the predominant method? It was paramount. It was paramount, yes. We we didn't. But then you've got to realise that technology mm -hmm. has improved greatly. When my parents went to school in the 1900s, hundreds, whatever, there was no there was no hearing aids whatsoever. So now we have great technology. It can be used in a classroom. It can be used for um, everyday purposes. And, of course, there's the cochlear implant. So a lot of things have happened. Would you mind explaining for people who may not be familiar with a cochlear implant what it actually is? Now, you've got me on here. Let me think. <laughs> I should know because my grandson's got it. The, the Inside the ear, there's an organ called the cochlea. Now, that's your organ of hearing. And what happens in a birth defect or if it doesn't develop properly, there's little hairs inside the cochlea that are not there. Those little hairs... Uh, the, they transmit sound to the brain. So the, the cochlear implant, there's a, a wire, I'm speaking very basically here, into the cochlea, and that replaces those hairs that are not there. And it's a very, I think my grandson has now got a Bluetooth one, so he can do all sorts of things and listen to all sorts of things with it. It's, it's, it's quite a magical device if you want your child to be an oral speaker. There is a choice. You can become an oral speaker or you can become a New Zealand sign language speaker. It's up to the parent's decision. And I imagine as well as things like hearing aids and cochlear implants, mm -hmm. there's also a range of resources that technology has opened up, not least internet and video technology and various yes. other things that enable education. They do. Now, I've been away from education for a few years, as you know, so I'm not up to date with the technology, but I am quite sure the hearing aids now would be far more superior than when I started way, way back in time. Though technology is a great thing. Um, children today, I have found, I had a, a visit to the school, and I found that most of the children from Ben Ash are now mainstreamed. Um, and I think I'm, I, I think I'm right. There's just preschool children at the school now. So mainstreaming isn't a new idea at all. It's come back. It will work. It works for a, a quite a number of children, but it won't work with all the children. You do need to have a tremendous amount of support, especially for New Zealand sign language users. They need interpreters. They need teacher aides. They need, and if they have residual hearing, they need every bit of technology that's going. So I feel very strongly that there must always be a place for those children who cannot be educated properly in a mainstream situation, that there is the school, Tiaro, um, my married, Tiaro Kotu, the name of the school? Kotakureo. Sorry, Kotakureo. Is that all right? Kotakureo. That the school needs to remain open. I feel quite strongly about that. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Mm. Um, Kate, is there anything else you would like to add about your family's story or about the history of Van Ash, the history of deaf education, before we move into our next part of the um, show? Um, I just maybe a little bit controversial here. I I have just come back, as you know, from being away for quite a number of years. I see that there is a lot of um, bilingualism sort of starting here in New Zealand, and that's fine between with with Maori people and I've always had the greatest of respect for the Maori language and Maori culture I've taught many Maori children I also have the greatest of respect for deaf children their language and their culture I just feel and I'm I just feel that with the renaming of the school that the words vanish have disappeared vanish is a very historical name, as I explained earlier in the interview. Maybe I can make an analogy. Mount Cook, Mount Egmont. Mount Cook and was changed to Ayorangi. 
Mount Egmont was changed to Mount Taranaki. Now, the iwi of those areas, those mountains were beautiful to them with the myths and the stories and things that they would have for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, this is the analogy. Now, the school for the deaf has its culture, and it's, that's the analogy I'm trying to produce. It has, its, it has its beautiful stories. It has its traditions. It has its language. And I really would like to see Van Ash placed in the name of the school. At the moment, it is not there. They have a beautiful name, and I like the meaning of it, but we need to maintain that historical feature. I've spoken to some of the members in the deaf community and they feel quite strongly about it. I know the whole thing was debated very well and the outcome, but we need to respect that there are two cultures. There are the Maori culture and there is the deaf culture. And these are the things that I think we need to think quite seriously about. It's certainly interesting and I think um, mm. and, and we'll touch on it later with Sarah as well mm. is the the idea of New Zealand Sign Language coexisting along English and Te Reo. It's trilingual. And, the, <laughs> it's and, trilingual. and also the um, mm. this idea of language as, as a living culture and English adopts so much Te Reo. Um, I, I imagine sign language is probably also adopting Te Reo as well. Of course. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? The the flow towards the future and also yeah. holding and truth. This is what it past. should be. We shouldn't be at odds with each other. We need to work together, but each respecting the culture of the other. Yeah. I'd like to say thank you so much, Kay, for yeah. taking the time. It's been really nice to hear uh, the personal experiences you've brought to this Kōrero, as well as your knowledge as a teacher as well. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rachel. And we'll move now to the interview with Sarah, where we talk about more about New Zealand Sign Language um, and more about current education practices, particularly as they're being taught at Te Heringawaka, Victoria University, Wellington. Thank you. This is Speak Up Kōrerotia, and now we're talking with Sarah Pivak alexander and we're going to be hearing the voice of her colleague, Rachel McKee, both from Te Heringawaka, Victoria University, Wellington. Sarah, it is so lovely to meet you and you as well, Rachel. And Sarah, I've seen your face uh, in my foray into learning sign language on the dictionary. So it's, so it's like meeting a celebrity from my point of view. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. And also, I'm very excited to be here to talk with you about um, sign language today. So thanks for inviting me. No problem. It's really lovely to have you guys here. We've already spoken a wee bit about the education of um, deaf education in the past, moving up to where we are today. I'm really interested to hear from you, Sarah, about teaching New Zealand sign language at the university level. To start off with, could you maybe tell us a little bit about what is it that you do in the Deaf Studies Centre at Victoria University? Okay, well, I'm a senior lecturer here at Victoria University of Wellington, and we teach two different um, groups of students. One group is where we focus on hearing students, undergraduate BA students, mostly um, first year undergrads, first and second year. and we offer a minor in NZSL studies to those students. So many of those will be studying other subjects, maybe law or psychology or education, and they add NZSL into their degree. Then the second cohort of students that we teach here, um, we offer a course, a program called the Certificate in Deaf Studies, Teaching NZSL. And that program targets the deaf community where we're training deaf people how to teach NZSL. So the first group of hearing students, um, we teach that, you know, on a regular timetable through the year, and they're in small groups of 20 students per class. And it's a really interactive style of teaching, very hands on. With the deaf students who are training to be sign language teachers, they come for block courses a week at a time through the year because they come from all over New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So it's a different sort of format. 
That's great. And could you give us an idea of what a class might look like for those two different groups of students? So a sign language class um, at university for, for a start, we don't use any voice from day one. So it's total immersion for those hearing students. And usually it's a bit of a shock for them to have a deaf teacher. They didn't realize they were going to be learning NDSL that directly or being thrown right in the deep end from day one. But they quickly realize that it's it's quite accessible. We have a lot of tools that we help use to help students understand. Of course, we've got PowerPoints, we've got gesture, we use role plays, a lot of actions and, you know, keep it simple step by step so the students can be involved. And the focus for those courses, really giving them practical communication skills like dialogues, how to ask a question, how to answer a question and how to actually communicate with someone in a practical way. So there's a lot of um, group work and practice activities, more so than book work, which you might find in other foreign language classes. We also have to set up the classroom environment a little bit different than a normal university class, which would have desks and chairs. We push those to one side and we have the students just sitting in a horseshoe so they can see each other, so they can get up and move about, which can be a bit of a shock at first. But we find that the students pick that up really quickly and Usually they report that their classes are a lot of fun and a lot more sort of participatory than a lot of other language classes they've done. So they make pretty quick progress. Those classes also have um, a one hour lecture a week with Rachel in spoken English where they're learning a little bit more background about deaf culture and community, grammar of the language, and it's easier to convey mm -hmm. in English. Whereas the other classes with me and deaf tutors um, focus on on practical communication skills. So they have three hours of language practice and one hour of lecture. So to have that balance of theory and practical. So yeah, they get they learn a lot during their courses. It sounds really great. You mentioned there about um, an hour a week where they get some grammar and they also learn about deaf culture. Could you tell us a wee bit more about what do you mean when you're talking about deaf culture? Well, the word itself, deaf culture, there are many deaf perspectives on it. And of course, that's changed through time as well. Um, it, for I guess it means basically deaf people's ways of doing things. And the fact that it's um, there are visible and invisible elements to that culture. There's the signing, the language itself. There's communication behaviours. How do you, for example, start a conversation or get a deaf person's attention in different contexts? So those are linked to language. And then on the more invisible side, we can identify there are particular values that deaf people have, the way that deaf people um, believe certain things or have certain attitudes. We would call that part of deaf culture. So, and it takes a while to really unpack People often think they're just learning to sign without necessarily realizing that they're also learning about a deaf worldview and deaf values and that deaf people might have particular perspectives on things. So it's important that they learn to respect that as well. And sometimes that's easier to convey, you know, in a lecture session and with readings. In my classes, I'm teaching them directly in sign language in their second language. So it's a bit difficult to go into depth into those topics. It's a really important point and it was really cool to hear that you you cover that as a an extra element. I remember when I was doing my first class in sign language and one of the first things we learned was this sign here for a lamb. And it, it was it's so simple, but it really made me think, you know what, it's really so important, isn't it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was just a really simple thing, but you think, yeah, that's a whole window into somebody else's understanding of the world. That's right. Another example like that is um, when we talk about family, I would explain to people that I have a deaf family, I have deaf parents, um, but most deaf children, their parents would be hearing. 
And so it's teaching them sign language, but at the same time about the social experience of deaf people. And in the lecture session, that can be expanded a bit more so that students are, you know, learning about those perspectives as well as the communication. Sarah, you mentioned that your parents are deaf, but that many deaf people may have hearing parents. How do you think the experiences differ there and how do you teach people about those? Well, the thing I guess that's the same is that whether you're a deaf person with deaf parents or hearing parents, you are still a sign language user. And so that's the main thing I'm focusing on in teaching. But it just means that my childhood experience was different because I had access to everything, all the communication at home. I had parents and a sister. So everything was accessible in sign language. So I didn't experience the same barriers that a lot of deaf people do. If a deaf people have hearing parents who... Um, are good signers, they might have that access, but often they don't. And so there's a lot more struggle around communication as a child. And so 95% um, of children have hearing families. And so that's a more common experience, that feeling of struggle. Goodness, I hadn't realized the percentage difference was quite so big. Yeah. And it's so it's really important that sign that, that parents of deaf children have access to um, sign language from birth. So Deaf Aotearoa offers a service called First Signs, where they have deaf tutors going in and working with families, helping them to develop sign language skills um, and just everyday communication skills. That that service has been going for a number of years now, and it's really important. And there's still a need, I think, for more of that kind of thing because. Um, in society generally, of course, not many people know sign language. And then, you know, there's a, the issue of preschools, for example, there's only one in Auckland, one in Christchurch, where deaf children can go and have access to sign language. So we still need to get the message out there and for people to understand that it's important for deaf children to have that very early access to communication, because that's what gives them access to information and to feeling included. There's all that work, isn't there, around the first 1,000 days being critical to a child's life. Yes, exactly. How about, Sarah, when you have the deaf students coming to Te Heringa Waka and learning how to teach New Zealand Sign Language to children? Um, what's that experience like for them? And I'm particularly wondering about the getting together of people from all across New Zealand um, coming together and, and sort of experiencing this together. Well, the course, like I said, it's part time and it's taught over two years. So they come together and they are you know, they're taught directly in sign language. So the course is directly accessible because it's all of the teachers are sign language users. And for most of those adults, they say, wow, that is the first time they've had that direct accessible education experience where they don't have to try and, you know, accommodate communication or use interpreters. And I myself was in the course um, a long time ago and then um, I became a sign language teacher, but that was my first experience of having a fully deaf class with deaf teachers and, you know, getting a different sense of what was possible. So when those deaf students go back to their home um, home situations, they have a different different sense, I think, of capability. Mm. They, they come for a number of different courses and the first of those focuses on deaf culture and community and we unpack you know what does that mean and people have a chance to reflect on that and how they would explain it to for example you know hearing people that they meet or parents of deaf children what does it mean you know to have a deaf culture then we have a series of other courses some the next one focuses on the structure of sign language linguistics and mm. most deaf people are quite amazed about that because even though they're sign language users they've not had the opportunity or formal training to sort of talk about the structure of sign language and they learn a lot about English at school but most deaf people have not had the opportunity to sort of study sign language and how it works and mm. the fact that it has rules. And then um, after that, the program focuses 
on sort of language learning topics, how to use a second language curriculum, how to plan lessons, how to teach and so on. And at the very end, the last course is that all of those students will do practicum teaching where they have to reflect on their teaching and um, improve on practical skills. So quite a few of those people do end up working in deaf education. And when they do work in deaf education, there's, you know, ongoing benefits to others, such as other teachers of the deaf or parents. So our course is kind of like a seed with a ripple effect outwards from that. Very nice. And do those same teachers also undergo teacher training through the universities as well? Or do they solely come to learn how to teach the sign language? Yeah, they only come for the um, NZSL teacher training. So the course is specific to second. It's designed specifically for deaf people for that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, if they went to other courses, they it would be a lot more difficult to navigate because there's no sign language content um, or they're not designed for deaf learners. So this course is much easier for them to access and to succeed in. Great. And approximately how many people do you have enrolling in, in both the sign language teaching and the hearing students learning sign language? And I'm, I'm quite interested to know, are you seeing the numbers changing over time at all? So for the hearing undergraduate students, we take in 60 new students every year in the first year, and we have 20 usually in the second year at any given time. So it's about 80 hearing students. For the deaf group who are training as teachers, we often have around 20. So altogether about 100 students a year that we're teaching. Um, as to the numbers, that's the numbers for the undergraduate hearing students has been pretty stable. We did see a little drop off with the COVID effect, but the courses are really popular at the university, so um, the numbers are pretty strong. With the deaf students, um, we've actually seen the numbers go up. And partly that's because Kotakoreo and deaf education, more and more of the staff are wanting to send their staff for professional development. So um, that's been really positive for us. Yeah, great. Is there anything else you'd like to add here around the, the teaching of New Zealand Sign Language that you do at Te Heringa Waka? Well, I can comment just briefly on the, I guess, the impacts of that teaching. Yes, what, we've, what we've observed is that we see a lot of our former students who go out once they finish their degree and they go into a whole range of fields such as they might become teachers, they might, uh, teachers of deaf children or regular teachers, they, some work as teacher aides, we've had others go into speech language therapy, um, people go into public services policy analysts, um, and then there's another group of students who aren't necessarily involved in deaf related services, but they might just be in other fields like theatre or law or um, or just regular teaching. And so it's fantastic to see those people bringing their knowledge of NZSL into their various fields that they go into and they become advocates for NZSL or at least pass on that awareness to others that they're working with. So for example, this coming NZSL week, one of our current students is a manager at Max Brewery and um, she took initiative with Deaf Aotearoa to set up um, a sign theme event on Wellington on a Plate. So they're running a special event for Wellington on a Plate where you're also going to learn NZSL. So, you know, bringing, bringing sign language awareness into her job is a really good example. That's really cool to hear. And in fact, it, it works quite well as a, a nice segue into the next um, set of questions that I had for you, which are around advocacy and the various advocacy roles that you have. Um, th there's quite a list of them. If you could tell us a, a few of the um, boards and the organizations you're involved in or have been involved in, that would be a wonderful place. Well, I'll focus on the current ones. Um, I'm at the moment, I'm a board member for Wellington Deaf Society. 
which is um, also known as the Deaf Club. Mm -hmm. um, and their role is to provide social recreational activities for the Wellington Deaf community. So I've been a board member for five years of that organisation. Um, and they, I also have had a strong role in the New Zealand Sign Language Teachers Association, which promotes professional development and advice for NZSL teachers. So we run workshops um, and, and events that are relevant to teaching skills. But just to go back for a moment to the Wellington Deaf Society, um, we have 14 deaf societies or deaf clubs around New Zealand. And those organisations are really considered the heart of the deaf community. They are the places where deaf people congregate the most and come to hang out and socialise and, and use NZSL. The first deaf club was set up in 1922 in Christchurch. And when I grew up, um, the deaf club was a really important part of my present, my parents' life. My dad was a former president. And so for us, the deaf clubs are very important at place where NZSL is actually maintained and sustained. So where when people come to the deaf club, that's where they'll see NZSL and deaf culture kind of live. And I know that, um, you know, it's been very important for the older generation to keep deaf clubs alive. We're seeing a lot, a lot more threat to them. So I feel a responsibility to support that because when there are children who are deaf who are growing up, they need places to go to meet other deaf people and also for parents of deaf children to understand and meet deaf people. So yeah, really important. Yeah. Um, and I suppose I suppose part of the advocacy that you're doing is is increasing awareness and um, advocating for the continuation of these sorts of services. Yes. Yeah, I mean advocacy can take many forms, of course. Um, like through my work in teaching students, teaching hearing students, teaching deaf students, both of those populations go out into the world and take that knowledge with them. Yeah. At the Deaf Club, it's more about, um, you know, keeping a place, a home for the deaf community. And um, these organisations have really important roles. The Sign Language Teachers Association has a really important role because that in turn supports more people to learn NZSL. So that, of course, feeds into you know, awareness and use of the language in society. So, yeah, I, I have, I do have quite a lot of meetings in my life where I'm involved in different activities around um, sign language. And I'm often asked for my perspective or advice because of my different roles, my role as a university teacher, my linguistic knowledge and so on. So, yes, I, I do get pulled into a number of things and I do what I can. To, a couple of years ago, um, Deaf Aotearoa asked me, if I would be one of the NZSL Week heroes on the poster. So I was one of the poster girls that that week. So that's also a form of advocacy is, you know, promoting NZSL and encouraging people to learn it and normalising the language. On this same sort of topic, um, what's your view on the hearing community learning sign language and the role that, that the hearing community has in helping the hard of hearing community integrate better through being able to speak even just a few signs? Well, that is a, a good question. It's, we really welcome deaf people to learn NZSL. And it's really great that they can be um, included in our deaf way of life. And the important thing there is about attitude. So it's not just about knowing the language, but it's contact with deaf people and understanding deaf people's goals and knowing, also learning from that, their boundaries about where to, who should be advocating, understanding their privileges, hearing people. So yeah, there is, we do need to be careful in terms of hearing people who know sign language, maybe just being aware of those boundaries. And remember the phrase, you know, nothing about us without us. I think that applies to everything in life. You know, whether it's politics, you want to establish something for deaf people, make sure that there are deaf community people involved in it from the start. If you're designing a health program, you need deaf voice in that. Or sign language students who are going out into their workplaces, it's really important that they include deaf voice in everything they do. I can see some strong parallels between what you're saying there, Sarah, and 
conversations around Pākehā learning te reo. Yes, yeah, very much so, definitely. We because we're my we're a minority language group, it's, the, it's similar issues. So we want to share our language, but at the same time, you need to share back, and there's responsibility that goes with that. Definitely. Anything else on the advocacy side of things, or or can we finish up with um, talking a wee bit about the Deaf Studies Research Unit? Yep. Okay. Sure. Let's move okay, on. Great. Just as, just as we finish up our quarter, then um, I'd be keen to hear what kind of work you do at the research unit, and again, what its role is, I suppose, in this advocacy space. So the Deaf Studies Research Unit is the only one of its kind in New Zealand, <coughs> and we're very lucky to have it here. It was set up in 1997, and the first project that it was established for was to document NZSL the, as a, in form of a dictionary and grammar, so that that information about the language could be shared, and that helped enormously in validating the language. So all of that work where you're describing and documenting a language counters, you know, people's perhaps misbeliefs that it's not really a language or it's not important. So having that evidence is very important background to advocacy so people can access our research and information. I guess the other important role is that the Deaf Studies Research Unit has directly produced a lot of resources that helps people learn NZSL. So for example, you're probably aware of the online dictionary. Back in the mid 1990s, the first um, paper dictionary was published in 1997, a great heavy tome of a thing. And that um, had an impact on people realizing that it really was a, a language. So um, we, we do research in quite a number of areas, uh, topics to do with the deaf community. We've looked at deaf children and mainstream education. Um, after the Christchurch earthquakes, we did a project where we documented deaf people's stories about that. Um, also, we have done research about how people are learning NZSL online. So we've got quite a broad scope of, of research. Really fantastic. Um, as someone who's in, been in Christchurch, I think that work into the, um, the experience of the deaf community after the earthquakes is really important. It certainly gets circulated a wee bit as well. Yes, it's um, on the website and people can share that story. Also, um, there's that part of that video was in a Te Papa exhibition as well about the earthquakes. So they had um, narratives from Christchurch people and they were able to add some of that data and add it to the Te Papa exhibition about the Christchurch earthquakes, which was nice. Given that you've just mentioned data there, uh, one question about data that I'm interested in, can you tell through the research unit, um, particularly I imagine the online dictionary, uh, how people are accessing it and, and are you seeing any changes over time as well? Yes, we have um, a database manager for the online dictionary um, and she monitors that and we know that the numbers since the dictionary was launched have really taken off. Of course, when it's NZSL week, the numbers skyrocket um, through the year. It's quite stable. Um, yeah, not surprising. But I think in as far as I know, in deaf education, that online dictionary is used as an everyday resource for teachers um, or teachers who want to teach a little bit of sign language in their schools use it. And even when our website goes down just for, you know, a few minutes or something, we get complaints or emails from people saying, oh, I was relying on that to use for my class, which does show you that people out there quite widely are using it. So we need to get it back up and running every time that happens. Yeah, how fantastic. And one thing that I really like about it, not only is there the option to watch the signs, the video signs, and then to slow them down. But also the words are in English and in Te Reo, a, a trilingual dictionary, really cool. Yeah, 
Yes, um, we also, one other feature is that there are example sentences in the dictionary so that you can see how a sign is used in a real context, which is a, an added value thing. You can do other things from the dictionary, like you can um, select signs that you want and put them into a sheet if you want to make a handout for a class, like vocabulary sheets with the signs on them. We know that many schools use that um, and, and people who are teaching NZSL. So the NZSL teachers all over New Zealand are using that and all the New Zealand Sign Language students are using it for their homework. So yeah, it's a really good reference tool. We've got about, um, there are about 7,000 signs in that dictionary now. And the number is just slowly, we build on that as time goes by. That was one of my questions actually is, is does it change as time goes on? Yes, yeah, we recently added another 200 signs to the dictionary. Um, but before we add signs, of course, there's always a careful process of validating with the deaf community. So we'll talk to different deaf groups around New Zealand, show them signs and go through a formal process of validating, say, Auckland and Christchurch and Wellington. Um, and or we'll also get feedback from people in rural areas. We can do that more online now. And if the um, agreement on a sign reaches a certain threshold, we'll include it. If if people say, no, we're not really sure about that sign, then we'll wait a bit longer and see if the sign spreads and takes hold. So we have, you know, a formal process for deciding what goes in the dictionary. We also, a couple of years ago, started a new website called NZSL Share. And that the purpose of that is to collect new signs or neologisms for signs that are not commonly used there, but where deaf people can um, upload signs, which might have, you know, specialist meanings or um, more rarely used signs. And so we've got about over um, about a thousand signs in there, which may not yet be in the dictionary. Some of them will take hold and some of them might disappear. So there's always new signs coming up, you know, to do with new domains like politics or issues of the day. Or one example now, people are talking about the war in Ukraine um, before people were not talking about Ukraine so much. And then suddenly this is an issue. And so you'll get the sign Ukraine coming up and people say, oh, you should add this to the dictionary. Another example was COVID, of course. I was just going to uh, say that one. <laughs> That was a completely new thing that came up in 2020. So that's now in the dictionary. That's the great thing about the online element, I suppose, is it can be refreshed as needed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you've got a print format, it's very um, static. It's, it's hard to add to. So it's not, there's still a lot of, of course, background work and processes that go on and decisions and um, ongoing funding that's needed to allow that to be ha to happen. It's not um, an easy process. You, there's a lot of costs involved, technical costs involved in doing that. Um, so if you want to maintain an online dictionary, we, you still have to, you know, obtain support for that on an ongoing basis. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about the dictionary? This is super interesting. I think we're very lucky to have a dictionary really of this caliber in New Zealand. And also the fact that there have been so many deaf people involved in contributing signs to it. I remember when I was a young girl, my parents were involved in community meetings when the dictionary was originally being made and they were uh, recording signs. So my parents were, were in the original contributors and then I'm still working on it. So that's lovely. And I know that so many people use it and find it valuable. Uh, it's a really, it's a really interesting insight into how languages change as well. I imagine that sign language probably more than spoken languages in many ways, but spoken languages too are constantly evolving. Yes, yeah, sign language has changed over many years and, you know, styles have changed and more recently, I think we're seeing a lot of quite rapid change, a lot to do with online communication. So deaf people in New Zealand are now getting access to overseas sign languages like American Sign Language. They're, you know, consuming online content. Um, and so there's more borrowing from some of those resources. 
So we, Rachel was involved, um, our team was recently involved in looking, for example, at the proportion of American Sign Language signs that have entered the vocab of, of New Zealand Sign Language, which is, you know, all languages do that. They borrow from elsewhere. So same process. Yeah, really interesting. One thing to add, um, remember before in the old days, sign language was not on media, it wasn't online. The only place you could see it used was at the deaf club or when deaf people met each other face to face at deaf events. Um, we used to have things like national deaf games. And so deaf people's opportunity to, to interact was much more limited. And so you saw maybe less variation, but now sign language is much more out in public space and it's on media. And so there's a much greater exchange of sign language and that sort of contributes to new development as well. Yeah, well. Uh, Sarah, I'd like to say thank you so much. And to you too, Rachel, thank you. Um, I've learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners have as well. Have you got anything you'd like to say as we wrap up? Just say learning sign language is really fun. <laughs> um, and if you're not sure, you could use uh, try online at learn nzsl www.learnnzsl and it's free and anyone can you access that website to have a go at learning and also access our online dictionary even if you learn a little bit that still helps communication with deaf people and it will make their day if you meet a deaf person and you know some sign language it's it's a big plus even when a bus driver signs thank you to me it, it feels great. So even those small things can make a big difference to deaf people. It goes to show, doesn't it? There's just those, it can be just those small things that give people some dignity and some sense of belonging. Exactly. That's true. Well, thank you both very much. I've really enjoyed this. And yeah, we'll have for the first time both an audio and a video um, speak up coordinator TF show. So that's something exciting for me as well. Thank you very much. Okay, it's been a great experience. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you.